Hey everybody, welcome to the webinar on implementing text and reading experiments in Experiment Builder. Um, Experiment Builder is a great piece of software for doing text experiments because number one, it can flexibly present lots of different types of formatted text, almost anything that's on your computer. Um, and number two, it can automatically generate interest areas around regions of the text in your study, which helps enormously in data analysis. So for to me, if if I were to do uh, an, exper an eye tracking experiment um, involving text, I would definitely use Experiment Builder um, just for that interest area segmentation feature alone. Okay, so let's uh, jump into the kind of agenda for today. So first I'll just get, provide like a brief overview of Experiment Builder and, and how the interface works. Um, and I'll also encourage anybody who is not super familiar with Experiment Builder to check out our support forums. Um, there are lots of resources for learning more details about Experiment Builder, including a video tutorial series. So you can you can sign up for a free account there and then access lots of um, learning resources there. Um, then we're going to talk about the basics of text presentation in Experiment Builder, like how do you set up the the text to be used on each trial, how do you actually present the text, et cetera, just the basics of that. Then we'll kind of shift, shift gears and talk about how you can use Experiment Builder's automatic interest area segmentation tool and how you can how you can configure options to determine where the interest boundaries will be as this tool is used. Uh, and um, just to give you a little preview, the interest areas can be configured at the character, word, phrase level, or in, in a kind of custom manner, if you like, to potentially like uh, create the interest areas at a morpheme or a phoneme type level. Um, so really, you can kind of put the interest area boundaries wherever you want. Then we'll talk a little bit more about kind of advanced text formatting options, and in particular, like how you can, if you want to do some really kind of uh, fancy text formatting, how you can use HTML tags. Um, then we'll just have a brief discussion about best practices for facilitating data analysis, like how you can set up your experiment so that you're looking ahead and making your data analysis life as easy as possible. Um, and then finally, I'll do a walkthrough of the basic text question experiment, and then I'll kind of hit the highlights of a couple of other examples that will be posted along with this webinar. Let me mention this, this PowerPoint and those examples. They'll be posted at the same location where the webinar was announced on our support forums. Okay, so first let's jump out of this, and I just want to give you a brief overview of this interface. So let me just bring this one up. So this is Experiment Builder, and it's a graphical user interface based um, experiment creation package, and it allows you to easily create experiments for behavioral and social sciences. And the way it works is you have all these different nodes up here at the top of the interface, and they're divided into three categories here, action, trigger, and other. And you drag these nodes into the graph editor here and connect them to one another. And uh, when you run the experiment, it will go through the nodes in the order that they're connected. So um, that's kind of the basics of it. There's a special sequence node which is this one here, which allows you to loop through the same basic structure over and over again, like you might want to do on the various trials of your experiment. And for a sequence node, you have what's called a data source, which will allow you to specify the different information that will be used on each trial of your experiment. So in a data source, typically each row of the data source corresponds to a different trial, and the columns of the data source contain information about um, aspects of the trial that need to change from one trial to the next. So it, um, that's kind of the very basics of Experiment Builder. If you want more information about this, I, as I mentioned, you can go to our support forums here. And let me just quickly uh, log in. Like um, when you log into the support forums, it's free to make an account. You can 
you can go to video tutorials um, or you can get to these video tutorials by going getting started with um, experiment experimental programming and then you can go to getting started with experiment builder and that points to lots of information about how to set up experiment builder how to set up the licensing and then you can access the video tutorials here and that that gives you a more kind of in-depth walkthrough of the basics of experiment builder okay let's jump back to the powerpoint so let's let's hit the highlights of what's involved in, in in a reading experiment through this PowerPoint, and then we'll jump out of this again and go back into to a walkthrough of, of how the, the text experiment works. Um, so sorry, let's jump here. So first, in terms of the basics of text presentation, the first thing you want to do is set up a data source like I just mentioned. And you'll have different columns for different aspects of the trial that will change from one trial to the next. And you will need to set up a column that will contain the text that you want to present um, on each trial. And so that's the first thing to do is just you can add a column using this little button here in the interface and then you can enter the text here and um, you can copy and paste from a spreadsheet editing software package like Excel or something similar or you can import a tab delimited text file or other formatted text files to populate the data source. But the idea is you get the text in this data source first of all. Okay. Um, then you add a display screen action. So sorry, I'm going to jump out of this again for a second. So by display screen action, I mean one of these guys that looks like this. And then you can double click on it. And from there, you can add either a text resource or a multi-line text resource. So let's go back into this one. Um, and if you add a text resource, it'll kind of look like this in the um, screen builder space. And basically, you can make a reference to the data source column that contains the text for each trial from that text resources text property. And that will make it so that it won't present this placeholder text, which by default would just be the word text. Instead, it will present the text that you have entered into that data source column. So when you run the experiment, you won't see that word there. You'll see whatever's uh, been specified in the data source column. So if you're going to do maybe if you know your all your text is only going to be on one line um, or you want to just do like a sim single word or something like that, then you can use a text resource. But generally for reading experiments, I think it's a better idea to use a multi line text resource. And that has to do um, with a few reasons. First of all, it has the ability to wrap to multiple lines. So if you use a uh, just normal text resource, then if the text is uh, longer than the screen is wide, basically, it will just go off the screen. It won't wrap to another line of text. So that's kind of limiting in a way there. Um, second, um, with a multi-line text resource, you you can easily like left justify um the text if your if your experiment is set up to use a top left um, screen location system which is one of the options in the preferences of experiment builder then you can do that with a, a simple text resource as well but it's just a, it's just a little bit easier and and simpler i guess to use a multi-line text resource um, so for those reasons i tend to recommend a multi-line text resource even if your experiment is only going to have uh, one line of text on each trial. Um, if you're going to use a multi-line text resource, then after you add the multi-line text resource, um, you can double click on the on the screen builder space and it will bring up the multi-line text resource editor that will look like this thing. And then you can use this little button here. You can basically put the cursor where you want, you know, press enter a few times to move the the cursor down on the screen some to position the the um, text where you want it to be and then you can add a reference you can use this button to add a reference at the current cursor position and you'll see something that looks like this but when you run the experiment like it, as long as you make a reference to that data source column that specifies the text that you're going to use then instead of seeing that symbol uh, you will see the text of each trial and so 
and that's how you basically present text that can change from one child to another using a multi-line text resource. Okay, so that's how you actually use the information in the data source to present the text. And then um, once you get everything kind of set up to use your data source information, this is a relatively new feature, but it's it's really just super excellent for for testing to make sure your text is going to is going to look how you want it to look when you run the experiment. So it's called the preview button, and it's this little button here. So when once you get the reference set up in the tech in the multi-line text resource editor, you can click this preview button, and you will see the first row of your data source. You'll see the text for the first row of your data source. And you can use these little arrow buttons to cycle through and see the different trials of your experiment. And that way you can quickly just check how your text is going to look when you run the experiment without having to do a test run and like manually go through all the trials. And it's great for just if you want to ensure that like critical words aren't going to be at the end or the beginning of certain lines and you can do that. Um, you can check to make sure that the font size looks good, that kind of thing. Um, so the preview, preview buttons is really nice. Um, let me mention also if you wanted to, let's say you do a preview and you notice that a critical word is appearing at the, at the um, end or beginning of a line. Sometimes people don't want to do that because of um, their kind of special eye movements that are called return sweeps that would basically move from the end of one line to the beginning of the next line. And that's going to kind of complicate your data analysis life. So in order to prevent those return sweeps from kind of interfering with um, the measures that you're going to try to ex extract in data analysis, you can force line breaks. Oops, you can force line breaks by inserting the slash in, like the backslash in character. And um, for those of you who don't know, Python is the scripting language for Experiment Builder. And so this is a little Python trick that will basically force a line break. And that way you can kind of ensure that your critical words aren't going to be in certain suboptimal positions. Um, you can also, just so you know while we're talking about this, you can use a backslash T to insert tabs. Like if you wanted to maybe indent the first line of, of a paragraph or something, you can do that. Um, so just so you know, you can, you can add that stuff right there in the data source. Um, and so that's kind of like the basics. And for most experiments, that's, that's exactly what you will do to set up the text that's going to be presented on each trial of your experiment. And in a little bit, we'll talk about some more advanced kind of formatting options, but that's the basics of things. Um, now let's talk about interest area segmentation. So this is this is the main reason why I um, would use Experiment Builder for any reading study because I, I personally am not aware of any other software that can really do this and, and def, like definitely not with all the different kind of configurable options that Experiment Builder has. So once you get your um, your tech, your data source column set up and you have your text resource or multi-line text resource, um, we want to set up Experiment Builder to automatically create interest areas around the different regions of the text. And um, this is basically to prepare yourself, like the, the participant's not going to see these boxes during, during runtime, um, but it, it, the idea is to prepare yourself for data analysis. So if you're using Data Viewer and you configure Experiment Builder to set up these interest areas, then when you run the experiment and collect some data and then open it in data viewer, you will see these interest areas will just automatically be associated with the trials. And um, let's talk about how you can do this. So the first thing you do is after you add a multi-line text resource or a text resource, this is an option for a text resource as well, um, you can select the multi-line text resource in the structure panel and then just check this property here called use runtime word segment interest area and it's called word segment interest area but the the segmentation options are configurable um and so this is just checking this box just basically means you are telling experiment builder create interest areas automatically 
for that text resource or multi-line text resource. Okay, so that will basically force it to create the interest area. So that's the first thing to do. Then you want to configure the preferences for that text interest area segmentation. And so you can bring up the preferences um, dialog and you in in windows you can click edit preferences in mac you go experiment builder preferences but basically that'll bring up the same preferences dialog and then you can scroll almost all the way to the bottom and you'll see this built-in interest area preference and you can click a little plus button there to expand it and then select the word segment section and if you just turn on use runtime word segment interest area then the default settings are going to be like this basically um you're going to have enable interest area delimiter checked and what that means is um in order to create the interest areas experiment builder will look for certain characters in the text that has been entered into the data source and it will use that character as it it will use that character in determining the boundaries of the interest areas and the if you have that turned on, then you need to specify the delimiter character. So this just kind of turns on the option to use a delimiter. And then down here under delimiter character, you specify the character that you want to use. Um, you can actually use more than one if you want, but most of the time you'll just use one character. And the default is to have a single space. So it's hard to see there, but that's, that's a single space between two square brackets. And so that means when it does the segmentation, it's going to use the space character that's in English between words as the um, character that is used in determining the boundaries of the interest areas. And then another default that will be checked is enable interest area delimiter replacement. And that will be checked and it's going to replace it with a space. So basically spaces remain spaces when you run the experiment. Um, and so if you're doing like an English um, language experiment or some experiment invo involving a language where there are spaces between words, then by default, Experiment Builder will segment the text into interest areas around each word. And it, you'll see something like this in when you open it in Data Viewer. Okay, um, so let's talk about some other options. If you want to segment the interest areas around each character, then there's actually a built-in option for doing that so that you don't really have to edit any of the text in the data source. You can just check this property. And when you check that, the other irrelevant preferences will be hidden. When you uncheck that, they'll come back. But if you check that property, then you will see something like this in Data Viewer. So you'll see basically an interest area is created around each character of the text and this goes for any language so you if this is often used in um like uh asian languages or especially like chinese where there might not be spaces between were um between characters so you can check this and then you'll get a, a different interest area for each uh character um another option is to basically put the the interest area boundaries wherever you want so if you wanted to put them at the phrase level then in your data source you could add a special character like here i'm using the character asterisk you can put that wherever you want the boundaries to be and then check interest area delimiter again but change the delimiter character to that asterisk and then in this case we want to replace that with a space um, so if if you put them like this, 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 then you'll see the interest area boundaries will be set up like this. Okay, so this is that you can pretty easily set up the interest areas to be um, done at a phrase level by using this option. And you can make it so that the participant's not going to see those asterisks by using delimiter replacement and then using a single space. So this will be re replaced with a space for what the participant sees. Um, if you wanted to, I didn't make a slide for this, but let's imagine if you wanted to like make book and worm, uh, be two different interest areas, but still be presented as one word for the participant, then you could put an asterisk like in between book and worm there and maybe 
bar and book you would be another it's two different interest areas so you could put an asterisk in between bar and the book you and then you could check delete delimiter and that way when you run the experiment um the participant won't see the they won't see the asterisk and they won't it won't be replaced with a space so you're not like adding an artificial space there so using these options you can pretty much put the interest areas wherever you want okay so um i wanted to mention that a really good idea to prepare yourself for data analysis is to add columns to the data source like let's say you have a lot of different interest areas in each trial of in each text of your experiment then maybe maybe in analysis you know you're only going to be interested in something like the embedded so this is just <laughs> let me kind of give a little um disclaimer here this, this, these are actually some sentences like the beautician that the hustler praised climbed the mountain just outside of town before it snowed um, <laughs> This is an aside. Basically, these are sentences that were used in an actual experiment that I did in, in a lab where I was doing research before. And I wanted to include these as kind of to add a little extra moral to the story of like, sometimes you can go so far down a rabbit hole of designing stimuli to kind of test some cognitive um, process that you lose sight of the bigger picture that these sentences are a little bit ridiculous. Um, so I'm sure when participants read these sentences, they seemed a little bit crazy to them, but uh, I think it was kind of funny. So I just included those for, for the example. But anyways, let's imagine we know in data analysis, we're going to be interested in maybe the embedded verb, in comparing the embedded verb or the embedded noun across uh, condition, across experimental conditions like object relative clauses versus subject relative clauses. In that case, um, as you go from like, uh, this is a, a sentence containing a subject relative clause here, as you present the different trials, some of them might contain object relative clauses, which will present the noun and the verb in different orders, overseer and liked here. Um, and so basically the sentential position of these of, crit of these critical interest areas might change across trials. And so the idea here is you can create columns in your data source that just code the position of some critical word or phrase, or basically an interest area ID that might change position across trials. And the reason you would do this is because these columns are automatically going to become trial variables in data viewer. Um, and that, that means they can be included in any of the output reports that you can that you create. And that will help you when you import the data into like a statistics package to actually um, run the stats on your on your reading measures, then you can easily like select the interest areas that are critical for each trial by using this information. So the idea is you can include this type of information so that it will prepare you for data analysis. If you forget to do this, don't worry, it's not that big of a deal to add it in data analysis in a post in data viewer in a post hoc manner. Like there's there are always ways to recover this, but it just makes it a little bit easier if you add it ahead of time. <clears throat> okay, so here you can see there's a, a column that codes the embedded verb word number and a column that codes the embedded noun uh, word number. So I just highlighted those. Okay, let's talk some more about segmentation options. So you might have noticed here we have a little bit of margin above and below the text here. So um, I mentioned actually it's a second point here, but you can configure the margins that, that are going to be around the edges of the text. Um, and in general, I would recommend to use kind of tall margins like uh, in other words top and bottom margins so use as large of a margin as you can above the above and below the text because that'll just help you um, basically match the gaze data to the words or regions of the text that the participant was kind of fixating it um, when you get to the data analysis stage and you can also configure how experiment builder will treat the white space that's between um, 
words or characters in your text and between lines in your text. And by default, it's set to divide evenly. And what that means is see how this, this boundary here is halfway between the and bookworm. Um, and that goes for all these boundaries here. So that's if it's set to divide evenly. And it's, it's a similar thing for vertical white space. So if we had, sorry, if we had multiple uh, lines of text, then that, that means how, basically how far are the interest areas going to extend between the lines of text. And there are different options you can configure for these properties here. And um, there's several other options. These are the most commonly kind of manipulated ones, but there's some other options for more advanced features of how to handle the segmentation. And if you want to read more about these particular advanced settings, you can go to preferences, or sorry, you can go to help contents to bring up the the help the experiment builder user manual and then go to preference settings segmentation word segmentation and it describes all these different properties or you can also just put your mouse over top of a different property and i made this screen capture while my mouse was on top of vertical white space treatment and you'll be able to see a little tool tip that describes what that property does okay so those are the more advanced um segmentation options and now let's kind of shift gears and talk about text formatting options so first of all it's important to realize you can use any font that's on your computer and that includes non-english fonts like for asian languages or really any language as long as you have that font on your computer almost any font there's some really rare um strange types of font that i actually have never seen in practice um but basically the the short version of the story is any font that's on your computer, you should be able to use pretty much. Um, then uh, there are other options, like you can apply formatting options, like you can bold or italicize, underline, um, superscript, subscript, like you can do strike throughs and um, color, you can change the color, that kind of thing, change the font here, change the font size. This is the line spacing and you can do up to quadruple line spacing and you can change the alignment options here. And then um, there's also a orient text orientation button. So that will determine where the punctuation is, is um, placed. And if you're doing like a non left to right language like Hebrew or Arabic, then you would probably want to change that um, orientation. And if you're doing uh non left to right language like where you want the interest area id like the rightmost interest er area to be one the second to rightmost to be two etc basically start from the right and go left then you can in the preferences word segment turn on this pixel based thing and then you can change the segmentation direction to control the way the interest areas are segmented um, to ensure like right to left or you can also do top to bottom type um, changes okay so that, that's kind of like basic formatting stuff if you want to do more advanced or configurable formatting then there's a, a relatively new feature that in experiment builder that allows html tags and so basically just right there in your data source you can see you can kind of see the different rows of your data source if you select a given cell you'll be able to see all the text up here in in the kind of preview panel for that for that cell so if you select a cell, you'll see the contents up here. And you can see that HTML tags have been added here. And like, so here's a word rushing, and you can see there are tags around it that make it appear red. And you can do a lot of different things with this. You can change the, the font. So you can see here the font, you can change the size in different ways, line spacing, um color italics bolds that kind of thing basically all the different these kind of html um, style options I, I would recommend to use the css html style um just in playing around with it it seems like the easiest one uh to use and i wanted to point out if you if you are gonna um th 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 this kind of html option for formatting text it's really useful if you wanted like a particular word to be different than the other words in some way um 
but if you're playing around with this stuff and you want to just check to make sure it's working out correctly, that's where this preview button really comes in handy. So like you can just set up your, your HTML tags in the data source, then use this preview button and quickly cycle through your different trials with these arrows and you'll be able to see in the multi-line text resource editor, you'll be able to see what it looks like and that will tell you if, if you've got it configured correctly. Um, and the interest area segmentation, I didn't mention this on this slide, but the interest area segmentation is, you can still use it in, um, just like you would for regular text. So you still have all the kind of options for doing interest area segmentation. Okay, so now let's talk briefly about some best practices. I realized as we were going through this that I left one off, so I'm gonna add that here. Um, Okay, just wanted to make sure I didn't leave that off and what we're gonna post there. So let's start up here. So, and this kind of actually relates to this, use as big of a font size as possible and as much line spacing as possible. So I, this is in a way kind of like a signal to noise issue. So any eye tracking system is gonna have kind of, you can think of it as like a fixed noise level and in, by noise here, I'm talking about positional kind of um, error. And the noise on an iLink system is super low, but still the idea is like, if you use super tiny font, then it might be hard to distinguish like which character or which word they're looking at when you get to data analysis. So um, without kind of violating, you know, the goals of your study, just use as big of a font size as possible. It just makes data analysis a little bit easier. Um, and I would say in terms of interest area creation, this is just my recommendation. You can kind of do it however you want, but um, unless you've kind of have an a priori idea about uh, which phrases might be critical for analysis, then I would kind of recommend to do the segmentation at the word level. So in other words, create interest areas around each individual word. The reason is because it's, it's a little bit easier to go combine smaller interest areas into larger ones than it is to split a large interest area into sub sub interest areas um i don't want you to stress too much about this you can always change your interest areas after you've collected data and one of the ways is you can just literally go back to your original experiment builder project change the way you've kind of added delimiter characters and set up the interest area preferences and do it you can even add like a 10 millisecond timer or something for each trial so it times out really quickly and basically just do a run through to generate and turn maybe turn off randomization of the trial order so that you know which interest area goes with which trial and then just do a quick run through and it, the interest areas are actually stored in text files and you can and they have an IAS extension and you can import those interest areas into uh, data viewer and then basically apply them to data that's already been collected. So you can, ch it's, there's always an option to change the interest areas after you've collected data. But it's, it's to me, I, I, for most cases, I think it's, it's a good idea to do it at the word level. I, I'm not trying to say that's always the case. Sometimes it is better to do them at the phrase level or character level or something, depending on the goals of the study. But um, I would say if in doubt, go for word level maybe. Okay. Um, this one, I personally don't really have a strong preference about fonts. I, in a way, it's kind of a trade-off because I, I, I personally kind of think Courier New looks a little unnatural. Um, but there are two categories of font. There are fixed width, fixed width fonts and variable width fonts. Um, and fixed width means that each character is the same width. So in this PowerPoint, I am not using a fixed width font, and you can see that the I is skinnier than the E, for example. Um, if I were using Courier New, then the I would actually, in terms of the width of this that it takes up on the screen, the I would occupy as much space, there would be kind of space around it, but as the E would. So um, there are some advantages to using fixed width font, and that, again, this depends on the goals of the study, but um, it, basically helps you to kind of control things like kind of physical uh, length of of 
words that have different characters within them, things like that. And if you are, if you were going to go into doing an analysis that involved, like, let's say you've segmented the interest areas at the word level and you want to like see which character they're looking at, it might make it a little bit easier to kind of map the gaze to the characters because you could basically just divide the width of the interest area minus maybe the margin width that was included to the left and right, but you could divide that by the number of characters and that would give you kind of a rough indication of how, of where each character was. Um, so there are little tricks you can do like that, but some people will have a strong preference about this and you might want to consult the literature or something for more information about that, but this is a consideration. Um, I already mentioned it's a good idea to log the interest area ID of critical regions of the text as columns in the data source. That was like the uh, embedded verb and embedded noun that I mentioned er um, earlier. And the preview feature of multi-line text resources is super useful. And then finally, like use as large of a margins as possible above and below the text for the interest areas. That can help you in data analysis. And of course, I feel a little bit like obnoxious saying this but always pilot test your data that unfortunately doesn't happen as much as it should okay so that's all i want to go through in terms of this powerpoint this will be posted on the forum so you can check that out but now let's i think it's a good idea for us to do a little let me save this to do a little walkthrough of this text question example that's going to be posted on the forums as well so <clears throat> um if you're familiar with Experiment Builder already, it's gonna seem very basic. It's not a complicated example. So basically, there's some instructions at the beginning. You can double click to see what they're doing. And then you wait for a key press here, it's set to any key or timeout after a certain amount of time. Then do the eye tracker calibration here. And you wanna use a background color that's similar to the background color of your stimuli. And then we hit the trial sequence. And this is where we're gonna loop through all the different trials. And it has a data source associated with it. And you can either access that data source by clicking here or by clicking on the drop down menu that lists all the data sources of your project, which would usually be one. And in this case, um, the data source looks like this. And there are basically, basically uh, two counterbalances in this experiment one and two. And when you run the experiment you're only going to use one of those two counterbalances and you'll get a choice of which value you want to use one or two and then when you run it it will only use the the, the rows that have the value that you chose and that's because that counterbalance column is chosen as the splitting column under randomization settings so this one basically has two versions of the experiment in one and that's because i kind of pointed this out already but each sentence um you can see this is an object relative clause form, the beautician that the hustler praised climbed the mountain. And then down here for the second counterbalance, it's the same basic sentence, but it's presented in its subject RC form. So the beautician that praised the hustler. So across, the idea is across participants, you're presenting the exact um, same sentences in all the experimental conditions. Okay, then you have a couple practice trials at the beginning. So a lot of these columns are really just to kind of help control randomization and just for uh, record keeping sake. So actually, let me just start at the beginning. A unique identifier for each um, row. Then you have a, um, an item code. So one through 12 here correspond to one through 12 here. And you have practice one, practice two here. And that might just help for doing um, different kinds of statistics. So it's just for record keeping sake for data analysis. Then we have a condition object relative clause versus subject relative clause. We have the actual text that will be presented. Then we have the question that will be presented on each trial. So in this experiment, it presents text, participant presses a key, presents a question, they press Z or Z for true slash for false. It's like a true false question. It's not even really a question, it's a statement, but Z or slash. And then some trials don't have a question that in this case is handled by putting no question in there. Then we have a couple columns that code the word number of the um, embedded verb, the RC verb, relative clause verb, and then an, another column that codes the embedded noun position. So in other words, it's the interest area ID of the embedded noun. And then we have block type, practice or experimental. And that's used in the randomization scheme to just ensure that 
once we randomize the order of the trials, which will be done because this enabled trial randomization is checked, so that will basically randomize the order of the trials for each participant. Um, but before that, that randomization is applied, it basically constrains the randomization so that all rows with a similar value of this column block type stay together and the practice will come before the experimental because randomize is unchecked and practice comes before experimental in the data source. So that's basically how we're randomizing the trials. And then we have the expected key, like which key should they press if they're gonna answer the question correctly. Um, and that's used in determining accuracy and that kind of thing. And then finally we have the counterbalance column that I mentioned. Okay, so let's go into the actual trial sequence. You can double click on it and then you're inside the trial sequence. And just like any other experiment, um, builder project you use a prepare sequence action at the be before you start the actual trial events and this loads all the trial stimuli in into the computer's memory and it transfers the one of the display screen actions from the from the trial over to the host pc so that it will be the background for the experimenter to see the eye movements on top of during the experiment then we can do a drift check action and notice here the X location and Y location have been changed from the default values. And this is so as to present the drift check at the location of where the first word of this of the sentence of the trial sentence will be. And so that way when you start the trial, they're already looking where the sentence will be, and they're not gonna you're not gonna have some like huge eye movement that you're gonna have to filter out in data analysis. You, you can just kind of look at the data from the time when the sentence appears until they press a key okay then we have a recording sequence and just like all our other examples this sequence it's the same node as the trial sequence but it is not used in this case to do any looping instead it's used to control recording of the eye tracker and so its iteration count is left to one and its record property is checked and is real time is checked to ensure timing which you optimize timing and then we send a little message to ourselves on the host PC that will tell us the current trial number. And so basically when Experiment Builder gets to this sequence, it'll send a command to the eye tracker to start recording. And then when it exits this sequence at the end of the trial, it'll send a command to stop eye movement recording. So we're basically tracking the eyes during this period of, of each trial. Okay, on each, so we have some variables here that come from the other category of nodes. And these don't connect to other nodes, they just kind of float out there, but they're used to log some behavioral data. So we have one variable to log which key is pressed in response to the question, if there's a question on the trial. We have another one to log the reaction time. Um, we have another one to log the accuracy, and we have another one to log the reaction time to the sentence. So th this one's for question, reaction time, and this one's for sentence. And so on each trial, before the trial begins, we reset those variables using this update attribute action to just some kind of missing value. And that's mostly for the question in case they either don't have a question or it times out, then we don't want the value from the previous trial to linger. So we're just going to kind of clear those out before we start the trial. Then this is kind of the critical display screen action that handles the presentation of, of our text. And we always use messages to mark the time when these events happen in the data file. And if we double click on this display screen action, there's our little reference that I kind of mentioned earlier. But if, if you expand the display screen action here, you'll see that it contains a multi-line text resource. And to edit the multi-line text resource, you just double click somewhere on the graph editor. And this brings up the multi-line text resource editor. And you can see this button here was used to insert this reference. And let me just insert another one to show you how it works. So you click here, and then you can grab information from elsewhere in your project. And in this case, we want to grab the information in the text column, and we can double click there, and it adds the reference up there. And then when we say, okay, we've added the reference. I'm going to delete that because we don't want that. Um, and if you wanted to just check what this reference is, you can double click on this existing reference, and it'll show you, you can see it refers to that same text column. Okay, so, so we're going to see the text appear here. And if we want to preview it, we can click this preview button and we can cycle through the different rows of the data source using this. And that looks pretty good. So I can turn off the preview. Um, if you wanted to change the font characteristics, you can select it 
click and drag to select it and then change the properties up here, change spacing, whatever. Um, in this case, it's all single line, so it doesn't really matter in the spacing. Uh, critically, for this multi-line text resource, we have that property use runtime word segment interest area. So that's going to make it create the interest areas. And since we're talking about that, we can go to the preferences, edit preferences, go all the way to the bottom, built-in interest area preference, word segment. And this is where we can change those settings that we discussed earlier. So you can see it's got enable interest area delimiters checked. We got a single space, see, in that box there. Um, we're replacing it with a single space. So that's all set up how we want it. And, and in this case, I used top and bottom margins of 50 pixels. Okay, then wait for a key. And in this case, any key from, that's pressed on the display PC will end the sentence presentation. Then we log the sentence reaction time to that sentence RT variable here. So we have a reference to its value property on the left, and we do a little bit of calculation. This is discussed in more detail in the Experiment Builder video tutorial series, but we're basically just subtracting the display text time. That's the time when the text has appeared. We're subtracting that from the trigger data time property um, of this keyboard text trigger. So it's basically how much time has elapsed from the time this occurs until the time a key is pressed. And that is our sentence reaction time. Then we're going to check um, to see if there's a question on this trial. And the way we're doing that is with a little conditional trigger. So let's zoom in so you can see. Um, there's a little check mark here and there's a little X mark here. And you set up a logical comparison here. And here we're comparing the value in the current trials question column, which is this. And we're seeing, does it equal the string no question, which you can see for the trials that have no question, that's what's entered there. And it needs to be entered exactly the same way there. If that's true, then the experimental flow will follow this check mark. If it's false, it will follow the X mark and go this way. So if, if there is no question entered in the data source column, we're just gonna go ahead and skip to the very end of the trial to this blank screen, clear the screen out, and then add a row, to, we have a results file up here. Um, this just adds a tab delimited text file that will be saved in the participants results folder in the project directory. Um, and this will include all the values of our um, behavioral data variables and all the values of our data source columns for each trial. So because we have an add to results file, no add to results file node at the end of the trial, it'll write a row for each trial. Um, so if there's no question, we just skip ahead, clear the screen and add a results, add a row to our results file. If there is a question, we go over here and to create this screen, I actually just literally copied and pasted um, this display text screen. I renamed it to display question and then I double clicked on this one here and then changed the reference from text to question. And that way I just ensure that is the same font, same position, all that kind of stuff. You don't have to do that, but I just... I don't know, seemed like a good idea to me. So that's again, the question's gonna be presented there. For this one, um, for the multi-line text resource, I turned off use runtime word segment interest area because for this experiment, you probably don't care about eye movements during the question, so we don't need any interest areas for it. We're actually gonna probably filter that out by using interest periods in data analysis, which we'll talk about it in another webinar. We're going to do a totally different webinar on data analysis for reading studies, but basically we turn that off so we don't even create interest areas for that. Um, then we wait for a keyboard response, and this only accepts slash or Z. I just selected this, held the control key, and clicked on the keys that I wanted to allow, closed it, and it selected slash and Z. After they respond, then using a different conditional trigger, we check to see if the trigger data key property, so that's the key that was pressed that caused this trigger to fire. You can see you can make it a reference by going to keyboard, trigger data, double click key, and it inserts a reference like that. And if that matches our data source column expected key, you can see we got Z and slash. So this is the key that corresponds to the correct answer. Then, 
we're going to go over here to an update attribute action that will set our variables. We're going to log which key was pressed to the key press variable, log our reaction time to the question, just how we did for the sentence, but logging to a different variable. And then we're setting accuracy to one. So if they're correct, we go over here and use these. If we're incorrect, we set everything the same except set accuracy to zero and then uh, in the trial. And we have a little timeout here. If they don't respond in 10 seconds to the question, then this will fire instead and we'll end the trial. So that's how this basic text question experiment um, works. And let's just do a test run so we can see what happens. Um, so I've learned that when you run this webinar software, screen sharing will like it won't be able to show what experiment builder shows so i'm going to turn on a webcam so that you can see what is shown <laughs> okay so i got a little webcam pointed at my screen and uh i'm going to close that and i'm going to do a test run this is not how you do real data collection you should deploy the experiment and then run from a deployed folder but if you're just testing it this is how we can do a test of the experiment and i'll just say yes that's fine we're we're doing a test run. It's building the project. And I have my host PC, while it's building, I have my host PC set in mouse simulation mode. So I'm not going to actually calibrate an eye tracker. I'm just going to simulate eye movements using a mouse. And this is the name of the, of the data file for the participant. That's the EDF iLink I data file um, that will be saved for the participant. I'll, and I'll just use the default test. It's asking which value of the column counterbalance. Remember, we had two versions of this, one and two, so I'll just use one. And we'll see some instructions once it gets running. So we got some instructions. I'll press a key. We're now in camera setup mode. This is where you would normally go through all the procedures to calibrate the eye tracker. I'm going to skip that by just pressing O for output record because I'm in mouse simulation mode. And then we'll get a drift check. And I have to go over here to my host PC and move the gaze position on top of the drift check because if they're not looking within two degrees of visual angle by default of the drift check, they won't start. Then I'll press space to start the trial. So we have the text is presented here and I'll just press, this is one of the practice trials. I'll just press a key to get past that. And then we have a little question. So I'll press Z or slash. Then we've got the next trial, okay? And that's the key. Um, answer the question. Move the I'm moving the gaze cursor on top of the drift check. Now we have the real experimental trials. Um, kind of ridiculous. Okay, so let's read that, and then press a key, and then um, answer the question. Looks like I misspelled the text there, hustler. Okay, so. I'm just going to go through maybe like one or two more of these. So, and actually, maybe on this last on this last one, I'll simulate some reading. So, something like that. All right, this is not real eye movements. And then maybe I'll simulate some reading on the question, whatever. And then I'll press a key. Okay, so now I don't want to go through all the rest of them. I'll press Control C which will end the experiment early. I'll turn my webcam off and let's take a look. So this is my experimental folder. This is, if you wanted to open that experiment builder product, you could double click this .ebd file, graph.ebd. If we want to check out the data, we can go in results and each participant will have um, their own folder in here and we can go into the test folder. There's the EDF file. There's our little tab delimited text file that has our behavioral data. So I'm just going to open that with something like Excel. So you can see if you just want to take a look at the behavioral data, you can see that here. So we have, you know, reaction times, that kind of stuff here. Okay. Let's now, I'm going to just double click this EDF file. That's not the normal way you would import an EDF for data analysis, but that will launch data viewer, start a new viewing session and import that EDF file to be the only viewing session. And you can see we're seeing the question from the trial. And that's because that was the last thing that was presented to the participant um, in this experiment. I actually, for the, 
for the last display screen action of this experiment, I have send iLink DB messages unchecked. So we're not seeing a blank screen for the end, which was technically the last thing they saw, but we're seeing the last thing. See how this one has send iLink DB messages is checked. That means it's going to show that last, and that's because we haven't set our interest period. So we're seeing all the data from the beginning of the trial to the end. So I'm just going to quickly set an interest period. We're going to talk about this more in, in another webinar. So I'll just start an interest period like that. Now go to the message question. And now we should be seeing the data from the period of the time when the sentence was on the screen. You can see the interest areas are automatically created. You can click on one and see all the interest areas listed here. We're going to talk about this more in data analysis. Um, I think this is the one where I moved the eyes around. Okay, so... <laughs> There's a simulated eye movements. All right, we're going to talk about that in another study. I just wanted to quickly, in another webinar, just wanted to quickly show you that. And then I wanted to quickly point out that I'm going to post another version of that same example that has these asterisks between critical um, phrases and that has the interest area preferences set up differently so that it uses that asterisk as a delimiter character. So I'll post this one. And I'll also post this HTML example where um, you have in the data source, uh, you can see it has the HTML tags here. And if you go to the display screen action that presents the text for the trial, you can click on the sorry preview button and see what it's going to look like in the different trials and see how the all the different characteristics change based on those HTML tags. So I'll, I'll post this as well. They Other than those two things that I just pointed out, it, the, the principles are the same for the rest of the experiment. Um, but I would encourage you to play around with this stuff. If, if you run into any problems in setting up your own experiments or just have any questions in general, then don't hesitate to get in touch. You can send us an email. Um, let me just quickly You can write an email there or you can go to those support forums and post there or you can call us or just get in touch however you want we'll be happy to help um so good luck out there happy tracking happy data analysis and if you're looking to learn more about data analysis in in a couple weeks i'm going to be doing a, another webinar on data analysis for reading studies and we have a, a also an introductory um tutorial series on how to use data viewer generally so you, you can check that stuff out but anyways thanks for joining and uh take care